I'm going to look at two teachings of Jesus today, which appear to contradict one another. But I'm going to show you how they're both totally consistent, and how their consistency actually reveals something else. Something which is not clear if you only read one teaching or the other. But it becomes clear when you put the two teachings together. This more or less hidden revelation is quite amazing and quite significant, especially for the times in which we live. The first teaching comes from Luke, chapter 9. John said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him, because he does not follow with us. And Jesus said to him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now this has been a very comforting message for many people, and I'll use a graphic illustration to show you why that is. Here we have a collection of different people. They could represent your church, your neighborhood, maybe even the whole world. The totally pure black circles are people who are against Jesus. They have heard what he has to say, and they don't like it. They resist him. They may even campaign against him, probably doing what they can to persecute those who are most outspoken in favor of Jesus. The rest are white or white mixed with darkness in various shades of gray. A lot of them have some kind of faith in God, and of these, many have some kind of faith in Jesus. They go to church, read their Bibles, some even attend prayer meetings or do little things to help others and to promote Christianity. Most are relatively indifferent, but they do not oppose Jesus, and that's the main thing. So Jesus gives them hope. He tells them that if they have not turned against him, he will give them the benefit of the doubt. He'll assume that they're for him. They are, after all, making little steps, and he appreciates that. They are moving, or at least thinking about moving, in the right direction. But then, we have this other teaching of Jesus, which is found in the 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel, and it's somewhat disturbing. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters. We heard previously that if someone was not against Jesus, he must be for him. But now, we're being told that anyone who's not with him is against him. And in particular, we have a picture of Jesus gathering. At one point in his life, Jesus cried over Jerusalem, and he said, How often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. See, Jesus came to earth looking for disciples, people with genuine faith in God. He gathered a tiny band of disciples before he died, and this little group grew into thousands more after he went to heaven. Jesus was building something he called the kingdom of heaven, and he needed disciples to do it. So he tells his disciples, if anyone's not gathering with me, he's scattering. Now we have a dramatically different picture of the good guys versus the bad guys, and it's not a popular picture. These pure white circles over here are the people gathering with Jesus. He said they're walking on a very narrow road. He said they've taken up their crosses. That means they're preparing to follow him to the death. He says that they have left everything to follow him. They are the gatherers. Over here, as we've already noted, are the ones who are against Jesus. We know that they are in for some serious judgment when they stand before God. But what about all these others in the middle? Didn't he just tell us that they were okay? That they were moving in the right direction? That even if they're not strong enough in their faith to believe the things that he said right now, he'll still count them as being for him? They're not against him? That must be worth something. Can you see the contradiction? One approach looks kindly on the masses of people with weak faith. It accepts them on the basis of their good intentions or at least on the basis that they've not done anything to show that they're against Jesus. In one way or another, they might be regarded as neutral. So where do all of these neutrals stand? The ones on the fence. The ones who are still counting the cost. Weighing up the options. Checking to see if there's some other way to get in without having to forsake everything they own. Without having to take a stand against their families without having to face persecution and death. Where are they? 
Can we just take the first teaching and throw out the other one? I think we have to accept that both teachings are correct. And when we stop running away from the uncomfortable truth that the second teaching implies, the consistent teaching between the two of them becomes fairly obvious. Can you see it? See, we have to reassess this whole gray area in the middle. What does it mean to be against Jesus? And what does it mean to gather with Jesus? The two statements taken together are saying we're either going to do one or the other. There are no neutrals. You either are gathering or you're scattering. Oh, you may not be pulling the trigger to kill Christians like these pure black circles over here, but by your lifestyle, by your silence, by your indifference, you show which side you're on. I want you to imagine a situation which happens over and over in many ways these days. You have a daughter who was taken away from you when she was very young, before you had a chance to get to know her. Over the years, she knew that you were her parent, but her head had been filled with lies about what an awful person you are. She was kept from ever seeing you or hearing from you. Then, after 20 years of hearing only bad things about you, the day arises when she is finally free to see you and talk to you on her own. As an adult, for the first time in her life, she can hear your side. But what does she do? She announces to you in very strong words that she is not interested in hearing your side. She knows that many bad things have been said about you, but she says that she does not want to get involved. She wants to stay right out of it. She wants to stay neutral. Now think about it. How would you feel about that? Is she really neutral? If she is not even prepared to spend five minutes hearing your side, then of course she's not neutral. Her so-called neutrality is an attempt to escape having to make a decision. In fact, she's already made her decision. And that's the case with so much of the world today. The world is jam-packed full of people who don't want to hear the truth. But most of them will tell you that they have open minds. They just don't want to hear you saying it. Oh, they want to come across as good neighbors, nice people to know, always ready to have you over for a cup of tea, probably even going to church or at least being members of a service club. But when the showdown comes, when the world sheds its mass and turns on Christians everywhere, they will be your worst enemies. They will be the ones whispering information to the executioners on where to find you, how to recognize you, like Judas did. If anyone could have looked like a gatherer, it was Judas. But we never hear a word of support from Judas for anything that Jesus said or did. There he was, one of the twelve, and yet a child of the devil. Sorry, Judas, but if you're not gathering with me, you are scattering. And so he did. He sent Jesus to his death. Now I'm going to leave it there and just quickly look at two more teachings of Jesus before I finish. These two teachings of Jesus are similar to the ones we just discussed in terms of sorting out who really is saved and who is not. Like the two about being for Jesus or against him, they both give a criteria for separating the good guys from the bad guys a clear line to distinguish friends from enemies. But one of the teachings is far more popular than the other one. And one thing these two teachings have in common is a word. Whosoever. Whosoever is a very important word because it identifies a passage as being more than just some casual observation or statement directed at one or two isolated individuals. When someone uses the word whosoever, we know that what is being said applies to everyone. Whosoever meets the criteria, or whosoever does not meet the criteria. The first verse is well known. It comes from a discussion Jesus had with a religious man named Nicodemus. He said, whosoever believes on the only begotten Son of God shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Wow! 
Incredibly easy, isn't it? Whosoever believes on Jesus, that's it. Just believe on Jesus. This has been preached all over the world until there are literally billions of people now who say they believe on Jesus. Eternal life, just like that. Just reach out and take it. But then, there is this other verse, which also starts with whosoever. Whosoever does not forsake everything that he owns cannot be a Christian. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that a contradiction? As someone said to me in an email just yesterday, my salvation is already fixed. I know that. I know I can't lose it. But one day I hope to have the faith to forsake everything too. Sorry, take another look, brother. Jesus didn't say it that way. And the two verses do not contradict each other. The problem is that we just never read the first verse correctly. Wishful thinking made us skip right over the word believe. And that's the word that links the two whosoevers. Do you believe Jesus? Not just when he says he's going to die for your sins. What about when he says, if you don't give up everything that you own, you cannot be one of my disciples. The word disciple, by the way, and the word Christian were interchangeable in Bible times. If you don't give up everything that you own, you cannot be a Christian. Jesus said it, not me. Do you believe it? These are not two contradictory teachings. They are both about believing Jesus, just as the other two verses were not contradictions. They only appeared to be contradictions when we thought they were saying that people can be lukewarm, double-minded, more or less indifferent in their faith and still get to heaven. But on closer examination, we discovered that such people, all those gray circles, remember, are the ones that cause Jesus more frustration than those who were out-and-out out atheists, Satanists, open enemies of God. Judas himself was one of those. John 3.16 Whosoever believes Jesus will have eternal life has only become popular around the world because it has always been carefully preached in a safe environment where you would never be introduced to the other whosoever. You have been sold a phony bill of goods. You thought you could believe Jesus without believing Jesus. You just put your fingers in your ears and you shut out the rest of what he said. Change the subject. Walk away. Attack the messenger. Do whatever it takes to isolate John 3.16 into a sterile environment, away from what it really means to believe Jesus. You could say that you believe Jesus, that you are following him when what you are really doing is following your own imagination. Oh, I think Jesus wants me to be rich. I think he wants me to spend my time working in this job. I think he wants me to put my family first. He wants me to make a down payment on a house. He told me to get that new car. Oh, and what a comfortable Jesus he's become. You name it, and this little Jesus falls in line, agreeing with anything that you say he wants you to do. But brothers and sisters, it's all in your imagination. That Jesus will not be around on Judgment Day. That's when you will meet the real Jesus, the one who said, the words that I have spoken, they will judge you in the last days. No neutrals. No secret back doors into heaven. No favors for churchgoers. No so-called believers who never became disciples. Either you fall on the rock of Christ's teachings and let them break you, or one day that rock is going to fall on you and grind you to powder. Do you understand that? It's the most important thing for you to get straight in your entire life and it simply is not going to help you to take pot shots at me or to argue that such a God is unloving. He's the boss, boys and girls. He makes the rules, not me, not you. Are you going to stop all your other distractions and start listening to those rules? Get your Bible out and look them up. If you're prepared to do that, I would like you to contact me. Just write to me. Please do it today. 
If you haven't already subscribed, please do that too, so you can stay informed as more videos like this one come out. Oh, and then there's video number five, The Most Hated Teaching of Jesus. Please watch it if you haven't already. You should be able to find it on the Teachings of Jesus playlist. I'll be looking forward to hearing from you very soon. Goodbye for now.